Mikhail Popkov was born on the 7th of March, 1964 in the cold town of Nariska in Krasnyask, region of northern Russia. Mikhail seemingly had a normal childhood. In truth, not much is known about his childhood and upbringing, except that at some point in his childhood, his family moved from Nariska to the Russian city of Angarsk. Popkov had a pretty decent educational background. Having attended the local public school in the city, however, he did not attend university. Having an interest in the military, Popkov opted for joining the police force instead, working as a regional police officer in the Irkutsk region of Russia. He was in the force for several years before meeting his wife, Alina Popkov, who was also a police officer. The lovebirds got married not too long after meeting and soon had a daughter named Ekaterina. Soon after having his daughter, Popkov resigned from the police force to work as a security guard at the Angarsk Oil and Chemical Company, which offered to pay better than the police force did. After a few years with the oil company, Popkov switched employers again, this time opting to work for a private firm instead. For the most part, Mikhail appeared as the perfect husband and father. He was often seen spending time with his daughter and was reportedly very devoted to his wife. But how did this seemingly normal man become a predatory killer with absolutely no remorse for his crimes? According to Popkov himself, his killing rage was motivated by the women in his life being unfaithful and immoral. He didn't go into much detail on the subject, but he hinted that the fact that his mother constantly cheated on his father and was unfaithful for much of her marriage. He also hinted that his mother was a raging alcoholic who would often abuse him whenever she went on a bender. This feeling of betrayal only compounded years later when he was married and began suspecting his wife of cheating on him. His response to this feeling of intense betrayal wasn't picking up a habit like drinking or simply confronting his wife. Instead, he chose to go into a murderous rage that saw him kill dozens of young innocent women. Beginning sometime in 1992, when he was still in the police force, Popkov started his rampage of killing young women who he described as immoral and not innocent. He confessed to having a strange feeling of detest and rage directed at women who drank or simply any woman who dressed indecently coming out of a bar or club. He would normally go on patrols in his squad car and would pass by clubs and bars. There, he would see these immoral women freely flaunting their immorality. According to him, he initially fought the urge to harm any of these women as he was also a father and husband. But apparently one day, the urges got the best of him. Popkov's first murder was a young woman who he picked up in his patrol car. According to him, when he picked her up in front of the bar, he had no intention of harming her, only wanting to give her a ride home as she appeared intoxicated. But as he later told police, he just had an overwhelming urge to kill this woman sitting next to him. Finally, giving in to his depraved desire, Popkov drove the car over to an abandoned road stating that the woman was even too drunk to notice. He proceeded to strangle her in his car till she was blue in the face and stopped breathing. He then proceeded to take sexual advantage of her lifeless body several times. He described the feeling he got as liberating and heavenly. After killing the young woman, he disposed of her body easily by burying her in a shallow grave knowing fully well that the thick Russian snow would cover the body even further. After his first kill, Popkov said he just couldn't stop and began planning better ways to commit these murders. He would take murder weapons from the police evidence locker, including hammers, ropes, and knives to use in killing his victims and would wipe off his fingerprints before disposing of them. Popkov reportedly had a tight when it came to his choice of victim and was very particular about this when making a decision. Police revealed that most of his victims were average height, full-figured, with strikingly similar features to his mother. He killed dozens of women. Mikhail's reign of terror continued for several years, even after he left the force. His MO of picking up intoxicated women from bars and clubs did not change much over the years, but his mode of murder got more brutal and vicious. In one case, Popkov cut off his victim's head and still took sexual advantage of the corpse. In another case, he cut out the heart of his victim, tossing it beside the body for no apparent reason other than sheer evil. He would kill with all sorts of items, including knives, screwdrivers, slipknots, 
and even an axe which police revealed he used up to 17 times on different occasions. Popkov was determined to continue his murderous spree for as long as he could, with his reign of terror spread in the 1990s and it wasn't just limited to his city of Anars, but also other neighboring towns, which he frequently visited after leaving the police. Despite the fact that he had left the force, Mikhail kept using his police uniform when picking up his victims as he came across as a trusting police officer, which was why most of his victims entered his car without much of a second thought. He was charming, charismatic, and sociable, making women trust him without a second thought. But bodies were piling up all over the city and even neighboring towns, and the police were clueless as to who the killer was. The police received widespread criticism for failing to catch Popkov, who was dubbed the Wednesday Killer, because the body of his victims were commonly discovered on Wednesday mornings. The criticism was because the police were working on the vital evidence, like the kinds of murder weapons used, and the fact that his DNA was indeed found in the body of some of the victims, who he had intercourse with post-mortem. Mikhail continued killing into the late 1990s, but his luck almost ran out when one of his victims survived. On January 26, 1998, in an attempt to score another victim, Popkov drove up to 15-year-old Svetlana in front of a public bench and offered to give her a ride home. Svetlana would later reveal that the only reason she got in his car was the fact that he was dressed in a policeman's uniform, and he had a police car. After a few minutes of driving, Svetlana revealed that Popkov stopped the car in a wooded area that she didn't recognize because it was dark. He then asked her to get out of the car, which she thought was odd but did it anyway because after all, he was a police officer. Popkov told her to take off her clothes, which she did initially refuse to do, but she later complied after realizing he wasn't joking and she got scared. After she was completely undressed, Popkov reportedly hit her head on a tree, causing her to fall unconscious. Popkov then took advantage of the unconscious teenager and left her dead, thinking there was no way she could survive. But as fate would have it, she did, waking up the next morning with a bleeding head. Doctors said that she was lucky to be alive, not just because of the violence she endured, but because she survived stark naked in minus 13 degree weather. Young Svetlana had told anyone who would listen that her perpetrator was a police officer, but the police were still reluctant to open an official investigation into the case. It took constant badgering and complaints from Svetlana's mother before the police finally opened the investigation. Svetlana narrated the story to the police, telling them her attempted killer was a police officer. This was where it gets a little bit tricky. After police brought pictures of present and past officers on the force, Svetlana was able to identify Popkov and his car with pinpoint accuracy and surety. But it turned out that having one of their own up for attempted murder wasn't something the Angarsk police force loved to do. Upon investigation, Popkov's wife Elena, who was still on the police force, provided an alibi for her husband, stating that she was with him during the time of the rape and attempted murder. This wasn't the first time suspicion had landed on Popkov, as he was identified by another person years earlier who had seen him pick up a woman at a bar, and the woman turned up dead the next day. It was discovered that the victim had syphilis, meaning her perpetrator could have contracted the same STI. Upon testing Popkov, it turned out that he was positive for syphilis, which should have been enough to arrest him at least. But in this same case, Popkov's wife Elena provided another alibi for her husband, and the police preferred to take the word of their own over evidence. Many argued that the police intentionally botched the investigation into Popkov after Svetlana's testimony because as much as they wanted to catch the killer themselves, they didn't want it to be a police officer. After Svetlana's testimony, Popkov became more careful but continued his murderous rampage all the same. His next high-profile killing would be Tatiana Martinova and her friend Yulia Kupriakova. Tatiana, who was only 20 at the time, was married with a baby. She decided to attend a concert one night after her big sister Victoria offered her tickets to attend the concert. Tatiana's husband was against her going, but she reassured him, telling him that she was attending with a friend Yulia, who was 29 at the time. After the concert, Yulia and Tatiana went out with a few friends for drinks, and on their way out of the restaurant, they were offered a lift by a policeman in the police car. 
On the morning of the 29th of October, Tatiana's husband called her sister, stating that his wife had not returned home from the previous night. The distressed husband said he thought that she had spent the night at her friend Yulia's house. But he called to check and Yulia's mother said that she had not returned home either. Both Tatiana's sister Victoria and her husband went to the police to report the missing, but they were told that they had to wait three days before a missing persons report could be filed. Meanwhile, that same morning, the bodies of both women were discovered in the next town. Tatiana's body was cut up badly, while Yulia's face was viciously disfigured with a screwdriver. Both women were taken sexual advantage of before and after they were killed and left naked by the side of the field. Years later, when Popkov would be arrested and his face splashed all over the news, Victoria realized she knew the man who murdered her sister. It turned out that both Victoria and Popkov had been involved in a biathlon together years ago, and that she would describe him as a tall, lean, quiet man who rarely spoke and only watched. Popkov seemingly committed his crimes under the radar for almost two decades until technology and strategy finally caught up with him. The federal police stepped into the case sometime in the late 2000s, and seeing how the police had previously established that the killer was indeed a police officer, they decided to compare the DNA found on all of the recovered victims to that of over 3,500 police officers in the Angarsk area and neighboring towns as well. After successfully getting Popkov's DNA, which was an obvious match to those found on the victims, he was arrested on the 23rd of June, 2012, 22 years after his initial murder. He surprisingly cooperated with the investigators, giving them every detail of every murder, even taking them to the scene of the crimes. Mikhail Popkov was charged with the murder of 29 women, the majority of whom were under 25 and others between the ages of 25 and 40, all in the Angarsk of northern Russia. He was convicted and found guilty of 22 murders between 1992 and 2012 and was sentenced to life in prison with no hope of parole. Two years into his sentence, Popkov confessed to an additional 59 victims, making him one of the most prolific serial killers in Russian history. He was then convicted of an additional 56 murders and was given a second life sentence. As if those weren't enough, he confessed to an additional two murders in July of 2020, making a total of 83 confessed killings in his lifetime. Mikhail Popkov was a social beast who played those around him so well that they vouched for him when he was first accused. But his true nature as a murderous animal came to light soon enough. Russell Williams was born on March 7, 1963, in Brooms Grove, England. Coming from a small family, his parents were David and Christine Williams, with Russell's little brother Harvey being born two years later. When Russell was five years old, the family became Canadian immigrants, moving to Chalk River, Ontario in 1968. Moving can be tough, especially when it's a new country, but the Williams didn't have to go through all that alone. They met the Solvkas, Jerry and Lynn, another married couple, and the two families became very close. A year later though, their happy tidings would come to an abrupt end. Russell's parents would file for divorce after David Williams was found cheating on Christine, with Jerry Salka's wife, Lynn. However, Christine would then get remarried to Lynn's husband, Jerry. She changed her name to Noni Salvkas, and moved with Russell and Harvey to a quiet neighborhood in Scarborough, Ontario. Russell was seven at the time, and became known as Russell Salvkas. Russell had a good childhood despite his parents' divorce. In fact, reports describe Russell as polite, well-behaved, and a shy child who then on went to become a young man that was self-disciplined, reliable, and very meticulous in his activities. As a teenager, Russell attended high school at Birchmount Collegiate, Toronto. He ran a newspaper out, delivering mail and globe papers. Russell also trained in piano and trumpet. In 1979, his stepbrother Jerry moved the family to South Korea, where he had been employed to oversee a nuclear reactor project. Russell would move to Toronto in 1980 with his brother, Harvey, completing the final two years of high school at Upper Canada College. While he was there, Russell was an exemplary student, excelling in drama, music, and sports, and was elected as a prefect. These are the times that foreshadowed the bright future for Russell, 
one where he would soon serve the country as Colonel of the Canadian Armed Forces. He went on to study economics and politics at the University of Toronto, Scarborough. He even changed his last name back to his father's for an unexplained reason, once again becoming Russell Williams. He learned how to fly at a municipal airport while studying full-time, whilst living in a basement apartment, alongside waiting tables at Red Lobster. Russell would enroll in the Canadian Forces in 1987, and by 1990, he had received his flying wings and moved to Manitoba, where he served as a flight instructor. The next year was big for Russell. He was promoted to captain and tied the knot with Mary Elizabeth Harriman, an applied science graduate from the University of Guelph. It was an intimate ceremony held in Winnipeg. Over the next decade, Williams' military career saw various changes in postings and promotions. In 1994, he would handle the transport of many important people, like dignitaries and government officials from other countries. Over the next decade, he would obtain a Master of Defense Studies in 2004 from the Royal Military College, with the thesis arguing on the issue of preemptive strikes in the Iraq War. By June of 2004, Russell was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel. His career would reach new heights in December of 2005, when he served as the commanding officer of a covert logistics facility in Dubai, called Camp Mirage until May 2006. His return to Canada wasn't uneventful, with Williams battling chronic pain. He received various prescriptions, including prednisone, prescriptions that many who knew Williams said that they were the cause of his insomnia. Simultaneously, the Williams sold their home in Orleans, replacing it with a townhouse in Westboro Village, Ontario. Mary Elizabeth was now an Associate Executive Director of the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada. While they made sure to spend their weekends together, to golf and garden, Russell was yet again mostly alone, despite being a successful married man. Russell's handling of abandonment or loss had been described as intense by his friends and family. As seen when the couple's cat, 18-year-old Curio, had to be euthanized. It was a particularly painful event for Russell, putting him under distress. Even Russell mentioned the loss a couple of times during interrogations for his crimes. During his time in Quebec during 2009, he received another promotion, this time making him Colonel. Now Colonel Williams, as he was sworn in as Wing Commander for the Canadian Forces Base, Trenton in July 2009. While Russell was transcending his competition career-wise, things would soon take a dark turn. Before 2007, Russell Williams was a decorated member of the Canadian military with no criminal records whatsoever. However, as they say, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. And so in 2007, Russell began breaking into homes near him and his wife's home at Ottawa in 2008. According to reports and evidence, he would scope out his neighbors' homes, making sure that no one was there, before entering to steal any female underwear he could find. He would also take personal items. On one occasion, he broke into a 12-year-old girl's home, spending almost three hours as he took pictures of himself in her underwear and clothing or while he pleasured himself on her bed. On another occasion, pictures he took showed him lying on a 15-year-old girl's bed while he pleasured himself as he held up a stuffed bear. Upon his arrest, other pictures were found, showing pictures of him kissing or licking underwear he had stolen. Some of them were stained with blood, there wasn't a search for a prowler in the neighborhood though, because no one usually noticed their houses had been broken into. Williams even burglarized some of the houses on more than one occasion. Much of the evidence used to convict him in court was from his own stash of pictures, as though he were a scrapbooker taking mementos of his hobby. It also showed the progression of his crimes, from breaking into dressing himself up in female underwear as part of his odd fetish, or frolicking nude in the bedrooms of young girls' rooms. He began to leave notes behind. Then he moved on to leaving behind items that he used to please himself sexually. But this wasn't enough for Williams. He was just getting started. In July of 2009, he took off his clothes and pleasured himself as he watched an unsuspecting woman take a shower. Then, while she was in the bathroom, he entered her room through the window and stole her underwear. Russell Williams' first victim was a woman known to the public as Jane Doe. She was a testimony witness at Williams' trial. On September 17, 2009, she had fallen asleep with her infant at home in Tweed when a man identified as Williams broke into her house, binding, blindfolding, and fondling her. He undressed her, took pictures of her naked body, and was in her home for two hours before he left. 
promising that she and her baby would not be harmed. A few hours after this incident, Russell Williams was a member of the planning committee meeting for an upcoming charity event for the Criminal Intelligence Service of Ontario. It was as though he was two different people in one body. He would go on to assault Lori Massacott in her home just two weeks later. It was not the first time he had been in Lori's home, having been there many times before to steal some of her lingerie. Like the first victim, Lori had been asleep on the night of September 30, 2009, and woke up to someone punching her in the head. Williams proceeded to blindfold and restrain Lori, forcing her to pose in pornographic manners as he took pictures of her. His intent seemed to be more focused on picture-taking than it was on physically abusing her. At some point, Williams seemed to show some sort of remorse, apologizing to Lori for the punch to the head and allowed her to take some aspirin. On November 25, 2009, Williams took his twisted antics up a notch when he stalked and killed Marie-France Como. She was 37 and was a military flight attendant based at the same base where Williams was a wing commander. Marie-France had discovered Williams hiding in her basement at home. Startled, Williams attacked Como, striking her repeatedly with a flashlight. Williams rendered her unconscious, wrapped her in duct tape, and for two hours, he went on to essay, torture, and torment Como repeatedly. He also recorded Como's ordeal on a video camera. All of her pleas and cries for help fell on deaf ears. After Williams was done satiating his evil, he placed duct tape over Como's nose and watched her die slowly. He then cleaned up the scene of his evil deed and went back to the base as though nothing had happened. It seemed as though Williams was breaking and general criminal activity stopped after he brutally murdered Como. His cooling period was short, however, and the following year, he would strike again. Jessica Lloyd was a 27-year-old living in Belleville, a community not too far from Tweed. On January 28, 2010, Jessica sent a text to a family friend before she presumably turned in for the night around 10.36 p.m. It was the last she was heard of, as she never turned up for work the next morning. Her family, anxious, reported her missing to the police, stating it was out of character for Jessica to not contact anyone about her whereabouts. Unknown to them, Williams had broken into Jessica's home that night, blindfolding her with duct tape and binding her with ropes. He took sexual advantage over Jessica for three hours and then took her to his cottage, continuing the torture for another 21 hours. He had promised Jessica he would not kill her, but he hit her with his flashlight and then he strangled her. Like he did with Marie, Williams documented Jessica's torture and death on photo and video. Leaving her body in the garage, he went back to work at the base. He returned to retrieve and dump the body elsewhere three days later. At the same time, the Belleville police and the general public were dedicating countless hours and efforts to locate Jessica. At Jessica's home, investigators had identified some unusual tire tracks that Williams had left behind in the snow. With this information, the Ontario Provincial Police searched all cars using the highway close to Jessica's home, looking for a match to the tracks they had found. Williams was one of the motorists in the search, and an officer noted that there was a match with his tire treads. Police placed Williams on immediate police surveillance. His tire treads were eventually matched to the evidence found outside Jessica's home. And when he was asked to report at the Ottawa Police Service headquarters for questioning on February 7, 2010, the interrogation lasted for 10 hours. And after he had been presented with all the incriminating evidence, he finally made a confession. He didn't just confess to Jessica's murder, he confessed to all of his many crimes. Williams gave detailed accounts of his crimes, including all of the tweed fetish break-ins and sexual abuse. He also showed police where his stash of evil was. Memorabilia from all of his crimes were carefully catalogued and hidden inside his Ottawa home and the tweed cottage. Finally, he pointed out the location where he had dumped Jessica's body on a mat. On February 13, 2010, the Lloyd family held a funeral service for their daughter in Belleville. When Williams was asked why he had committed these crimes, he simply said, I don't know the answers, and I'm pretty sure the answers don't matter. Before his hearing, Williams tried to commit suicide and took on a hunger strike. Both attempts were unsuccessful, and he was placed under 24-hour suicide watch and solitary confinement. A grand total of 82 criminal code charges were filed against Russell Williams. He made his first appearance in court on October 7, 2010. On October 18, 2010, Russell Williams pleaded guilty to all the charges. 
On the first day and over the course of his trial, accounts of other crimes emerged. These include a mother who was attacked while she and her newborn were asleep in the house. It was also revealed that Williams possessed pedophiliac tendencies, based on the number of underwear he had stolen belonging to girls as young as nine. Williams' total number of home invasions and break-ins between September 2007 and November 2009 was rounded up at 82. The prosecution revealed that Williams even kept tabs on police reports of his crimes. He had a system for his crimes, logging and documenting details about how they went down, like a shopkeeper doing inventory. Some of the evidence, such as photos of Williams wearing the underwear he had stolen, was released to the press and published in papers. On October 19, 2010, Williams was found guilty of all charges filed against him. Three days later, he was sentenced to two concurrent life terms. Some accounts hold that Williams seemed to show remorse for his actions. He wrote letters by hand to the parents of Jessica Lloyd and Marie France Como, as well as his wife, regretting the shame he had put her through and asking her to take care of their cat, Rosie. Marie Elizabeth filed for divorce from him in 2010, and their marriage was annulled in 2014. Initially imprisoned at Kingston Penitentiary, Russell Williams is now incarcerated at Port Carrier Institution in Quebec, after Kingston was closed down. In an exorcism of sorts, Williams' uniform was burnt by the Canadian forces. All of his medals and awards were revoked. Niels Holga was born and raised in West Germany on December 30, 1976. When he was a small boy, he grew up in the coastal town of Wilhelmshaven in Lower Saxony. Niels said that throughout his childhood, he was never exposed to violence at home. His parents didn't fight any more than a normal set of parents would, and his home was very well put together. He also explained that he grew up in a highly protective atmosphere. These days, most of us would probably call this type of home environment sheltered, and that definitely seems to be the case for Niels. His parents did everything within their power to keep him free from harm and to keep him on the straight and narrow. To top them off, both his father and his grandmother had dedicated their lives to helping people. They were both nurses, and it seems like Niels always looked up to them. His father set a great example for what a nurse should be, after having followed in the footsteps of his own mother. When Niels became of age, he decided that he would become a nurse as well. On the surface, it seemed like Niels also wanted to do everything within his power to help others in his community. However, as time passed by, his desires would become much darker and more sinister. Niels went through very in-depth training to become a nurse. Unlike nursing schools that you may find in the United States and other parts of the world, in Germany at the time, nursing could be taken as a vocational course instead of requiring countless years of college. By 1997, Niels had completed his training and became a nurse, working at St. Wilhad Hospital. He was just 21 years of age. By 2004, Niels had begun to explore other opportunities in life. Niels managed to find love and decided to settle down a bit more. He and his longtime girlfriend were married in 2004, and later that year, his wife would give birth to their daughter. By 1999, Niels had decided to move on from his job at the hospital and began working for a different clinic, while holding down an identical position as a nurse. This was the result of accepting a job offer at Oldenburg Clinic. He would be tasked with taking care of patients in the intensive care unit at a cardiatric surgery ward known as Ward 211. Niels had been working here for several years before staff members began to get a bit suspicious of him. By August of 2001, just two years after accepting his new job, a large meeting was called at the clinic. The board members were concerned that a shockingly large number of patients had been losing their lives over the last year. The leaders explained that there was an unusually large number of deaths that had seemingly come out of nowhere. To top this off, there was also an increase in the number of resuscitations and an increase in the number of deaths months after resuscitation. According to the board, 58% of these deaths took place while Niels was on duty. After the meeting had drawn to a close, Niels knew that the leaders of the clinic were on to him. The following day, he would call in sick for work and would remain away from the clinic for a total of three weeks. For Niels, this seemed like the perfect way to lay low. However, he only made his situation worse. This is because after leaving his job for a short time, the number of deaths dramatically decreased at the clinic. 
For some of the workers who were suspicious of him, this proved that Niels may have had a part in some of the unusual deaths that had been taking place recently. Once he returned back to work, Niels was asked by one of the head physicians in Ward 211 to transfer to a different unit. It's unknown if this was due to a difference in opinion or if the doctor truly felt that Niels' skills would be more useful elsewhere. Nevertheless, Niels accepted his proposal and would soon be transferred to the anesthesiology unit later that year in 2001. It was at this point that the heat really began to amp up for Niels. The head physician at his new ward explained that he didn't like how Niels always forced himself into emergency situations. To add to this, he explained to Niels that after he would become involved in emergency situations, the patients would have a significantly higher chance of passing away or facing serious difficulties. The doctor never accused Niels of anything outright, but it seems as though his words were very clear. Soon after the two had this conversation, Niels was approached by one of the leaders of the clinic. The worker gave Niels an ultimatum. Niels was told that he would need to transfer units once again or be fired from his position and given three months of severance pay. If he accepted the transfer, he would be placed in the logistics unit that did nothing but help move patients from one place to another throughout the hospital and clinic. That way, potential lives weren't in danger. It doesn't seem like Niels liked either of these options. Soon after the conversation with the clinic leader, he began looking for a job elsewhere. Just a couple of weeks after the meeting with the leader of the clinic, Niels was given a very good reference letter by one of his superiors. In the letter, the superior explained that Niels was an incredible nurse that always went above and beyond what was expected of him. The letter acknowledged his devotedness and cooperative conduct as well and even explained that every task he completed was to the utmost satisfaction. It seems that even though the clinic threatened to fire him, they didn't hold any ill will against him, or they really just wanted him to move on. It's difficult to know which way they were leaning. By December of that year, 2002, Niels had accepted a new job at the Delman Horse Clinic. Unfortunately, his questionable behavior did not end when he left his former job. At his new clinic, the dark cloud would continue to linger over Niels and his clinic. As soon as he joined the new team, deaths rose to unprecedented levels. Fatalities began to rise and were occurring every time Niels was on duty. For the most part, these patients would be losing their lives due to arrhythmia or other blood and heart-related problems. Many of his new co-workers began to shy away from him, not wanting to become involved in whatever was going on around him. It seems that many of his superiors were suspicious of him as well, but none of them took a step forward and accused him of anything, as police would later find out in court proceedings. By all means, this was gross negligence on the part of the clinic, as some of his co-workers had found four empty vials of Agmaline while Niels was on duty one day, which causes life-threatening arrhythmia and heart-related problems. This information was taken to the leaders of the clinic, but they did nothing to stop him. A brief investigation into the matter proved that no doctors had prescribed that medication recently and none of the patients had been taking that medication when the vials were found. All eyes were now on Niels, though it seemed like everyone around him was too scared to do anything about it. By June of 2005, police were finally beginning to close in on Niels. One of his co-workers had managed to catch him intentionally sabotaging a patient's medical pump. As the worker soon learned, he had been injecting it with the gymaline, the same chemical he was suspected of three years prior. This incident was enough to finally get the police involved. So, they showed up and began conducting an investigation. They found that Niels had been tampering with other patients throughout the years, and soon enough, the case began to explode. Police requested all of the death records and time cards for the previous two years, taking their investigation all the way back to 2003. It didn't take them long at all to begin connecting the dots, and every trail they followed led back to Niels. The investigation would soon come to the conclusion that, over the last two years, at least 73% of the deaths at this clinic could be connected to Niels in some way or another. Though, it seems like the law works much differently in Germany than it does in other parts of the world. Even though this was definitely proven by investigators, there was still only a small penalty to be paid by Niels rather than being sentenced to prison for life, as he would have been if he lived in the United States, he was only facing five years behind bars and a temporary suspension of his nursing license. After being taken to trial with these allegations, he was found guilty in December of 2006. He was then taken away to prison to face his punishment. 
However, he wouldn't get off that easily. No sooner than his sentence was handed down, a team appealed his conviction. Soon enough, his conviction was reversed, but not the way you might be expecting. It wasn't reversed so as to release Niels from prison. Rather, it was reversed in exchange for a larger sentence. In the end, he was handed a seven and a half year sentence, and his nursing license was to be permanently revoked. By January of 2014, it was almost time for Niels to be released from prison. Police knew that he must have been involved in more crimes than he had been previously sentenced for. So they began working on getting to the bottom of every last death that occurred on Niels' watch. The local district attorney's office helped with the investigation, and by September of 2014, Niels Hogel was suspected of at least three counts of murder, as well as two counts of attempted murder. It seems that at this point, Niels knew that the game was up and that he had been found out. He decided not to resist the charges and instead confessed. Though, he shocked the police with his confession. Not only did Niels accept involvement for taking the lives of three people and trying to take the lives of two others, but he added that he had claimed the lives of at least 30 others during this time. After investigating the issues even further, officers learned of 90 patients that had been poisoned by Niels. Of these 90 patients, about 60 were successfully resuscitated. However, the remaining 30 lost their lives. Just a few months after learning this, Niels Hogel was sentenced to life in prison. His sentence was finalized in March of 2015. The problem is that despite all of this, prosecutors still don't know the motive behind Niels' crimes. They suspect that he simply acted out of boredom and a sick desire to kill. However, Others believe that he may have been trying to showcase how good he was at resuscitating someone. Though, this is nothing but speculation. Investigators still suspect that there was far more to this case than meets the eye, so they continued their investigations even further and kept digging into Neil's past, as well as the many deaths that took place at his various places of work. By October of 2014, they had learned that another 200 people had likely been victimized. Though these weren't cases like they had investigated previously. Before of the 90 people Niels had victimized, only 30 passed away. However, of the 200 cases they were now investigating, all 200 of them passed away, meaning there were likely hundreds of others who had been poisoned by Niels, but simply didn't know about it. The case had grown to such a massive degree that the local police needed to create a special task force to investigate Niels' crimes, with the task force being dubbed Cardio, spelt with AK. The prosecutors knew that they needed concrete evidence to help push these cases forward. To do this, they decided to exhume 134 of the victims that were linked to the cases. This task led them to visit 67 different cemeteries. But in most of these cases, the victims had decomposed far too much to be able to prove their allegations. In addition to these cases, a further 101 victims were suspected, but their bodies had been cremated, so there was no way to verify these accusations. Even more suspected victims were exhumed in 2015, and it was found that they had trace amounts of unprescribed heart medication in their blood. 37 other cases were opened in 2016, but it was around this time that police realized that their efforts were futile. No matter how many victims they managed to uncover, nothing was going to alter Neil's sentence. Thus, they began to take a step back on their investigative efforts and revealed to the public in 2017 that he was officially connected to around 90 cases, but that they suspected him of hundreds more. It was here that his case eventually died down while officers submitted their information to the courts awaiting a trial that was scheduled to take place in 2018 and 2019. In the end, 100 charges were placed against Niels at trial. Niels Hogel admitted to 43 of the cases on the first day of the trial. He claimed that he couldn't remember 52 of the victims, then denied any involvement in five of the remaining victims. As the trial finally came to a close, Niels Hogel was found guilty of 85 murders. Needless to say, he will be spending the rest of his life behind bars, but the impact of his actions still resonate through the community, and it seems like police may still be investigating some additional cases that could be placed against him in the coming years. A shooting in the Superbike Motorsports shop that killed four people would leave investigators, paramedics, and the people of the society agitated and restless for finding the suspect. The owner of the Superbike Motorsports, 30-year-old Scott Ponder, 
his mother Beverly Guy, 52, the shop mechanic Chris Sherbert, 26, and Ponder's close friend and service manager, the 29-year-old Brian Lucas, were shot while they were working at the shop. What was the reason behind this quadruple murder? Who was responsible for this atrocious crime and why? Chesney is a small town situated in Spartanburg and Cherokee counties in the state of South Carolina. A small city with only 851 population as of the 2021 census. The city enjoys rather stable weather with warm summers and cool winters. The city is filled with lumber mills and cotton mills while also being home to many historic places. With a crime rate of 47 per thousand residents, Chesney has its fair share when it came to notorious crimes, but the residents weren't considered to be violent. That's why when the quadruple murder took place on November 6, 2003, the people of Chesney were left in a daze. Scott Dean Ponder was born on February 7, 1973, and was raised by his loving family consisting of his mother Beverly Guy and his stepfather Terry Guy. From an early age, Scott showed interest in cars and motorbikes that was greatly supported by his parents who wanted him to improve his riding skills. They even got him a racer's license when he turned legal. Young Scott started taking racing as a lifestyle, even participating at the Daytona Motor Speedway in Florida. His sharp skills and excellent racing earned him numerous admirers and turned him into a local hero in the town of Chesney. Scott was also very social and preferred to hang out with large groups. People also loved Scott's company. Scott started the idea of the Superbike Motorsports first at his grandmother's backyard in the late 1990s where he would repair bikes. Slowly he started to upgrade his shop to a one garage building in 2001. He even decided to take in his best friend Brian Lucas as his co-partner in the business, and the two young men started to expand their business further. They signed up with Suzuki for a dealership and their business grew unexpectedly in a short period of time. Brian, who used to work part-time at the starting of the business, decided to leave his job to become a full-time manager of the store. With their hard work and knowledge, the pair started attracting a lot of customers and the business started to bloom. Even though they were salesmen, they took utmost care when it came to their customers' knowledge about bikes or racing in general. Scott's mother, who first visited the store occasionally, now started to pay regular visits. Soon she took up the job of taking care of the accounting, payroll, cash drops, and other such work. With the trio, the business boomed, selling 100,000 motorbikes every month. Scott decided to attend an industry convention in Chicago. It was during this trip that Scott met his wife Melissa Brackman, a former homecoming queen from Stafford High School. They immediately clicked and started to enjoy each other's company, thus meeting up with each other often. As their relationship grew stronger, they decided to get married. Their love life both before and after their marriage, mirrored that of a fairy tale where the love grew stronger every passing day. To complete their family, Scott and Melissa decided to have a baby, but unfortunately for them, none of their attempts were bearing any fruit. Frustrated, the couple sought medical attention and advice, and finally, after months of struggles, Melissa was pregnant with a little baby boy in October of 2003. With millions of sales in the very first year of business, Scott knew he had to expand his store even more. In order to do this, he required more hands on deck and decided to hire a new mechanic, Chris Sherbert. Chris was quite well known around town for his skilled use of the wrench that attracted Scott towards him. Before them, Scott, Beverly, Brian, and Chris became a sort of a dream team and their business started to gain attention even outside the small town of Chesney. Everything was going perfectly for the young and talented Scott Ponder until the arrival of his doomsday. Living such a perfect life, Scott never imagined his happiness to be cut short, but this was what happened on November 6, 2003. It was a normal day with not a cloud in the sky and the sun was beaming, but it was not the case at the Superbike Motorsports. Scott and the others started their day at the shop like any other. There were a few customers browsing items in the store. One of them was Kelly Sisk who had his four-year-old son with him. He was going to buy a go-kart for his family and after paying for it, he hung around in the shop for a little while longer. Brian actually had the day off because he was planning to go on a holiday with his family. But he was called in by Scott because there was a customer who said that the bike was not tended to as they promised. Brian came to the shop and immediately started to work on the customer's bike. Scott was tending to another customer when Beverly came by after taking Scott's cancer-stricken grandmother to chemo. 
She used to take deposits for her son to the bank and that day, she was intending to do the same. When she dropped by, she started to help Scott a little at the counter since she was planning to go to the bank much later. At around 2.30 p.m., Scott's friend Noah Lee called the shop. Beverly answered the phone and he asked if he could stop by the shop and it would only take him seven minutes for him to reach the shop to which Beverly agreed. The conversation was short and after putting the phone back down, Beverly decided to use the bathroom. In the span of seven minutes, all four people in the shop, Scott, Brian, Beverly and Chris, were savagely shot to death in the Superbike Motorsports premises. At 3 p.m. when Scott's friend Noah came by, he saw Scott and Brian lying at the front of the shop as still as statues. At first he thought they were playing a trick on him. He even lightly kicked both of them, telling them to stop messing with him until he saw the pool of blood underneath their bodies and immediately dialed 911. Police and paramedics immediately rushed to the scene. After all, it was the first ever quadruple murder in such a small town like Chesney. The news of the homicide spread like wildfire and not only the victim's family but a dozen other people gathered at the crime scene in order to catch a glimpse. The police wasted no time and immediately started their investigation. They found the mechanic, Chris's body, at the back of the shop. It was bent over as if he was working on a bike right before he was robbed of his life. Next they found Beverly's body inside the shop right in front of the bathroom. The police believe she was ambushed right when she came out of the bathroom. The police found Brian and Scott's bodies, both lying at the front of the store. Brian's body was closer to the door near the sidewalk while Scott's body was closer to one of the parked cars in the parking lot. This the police inferred was maybe because both Scott and Brian were trying to run for their lives. They went inside, probably on hearing the gunshots, and came face to face with the shooter. And on seeing the dead bodies of Chris and Beverly, they immediately ran out the door but their attempt to escape failed miserably. The police and forensic teams searched the crime scene thoroughly and gathered blood samples and other evidence from the crime scene. This was an execution-style homicide, where the shooter entered the shop with the motive to murder the people present there and shot them in the chest and head. Scott's wife Melissa got a call about the shooting and immediately rushed to the scene. Detectives conducted a thorough investigation and it didn't take them long to arrive at their first clue. From the statements made by a few passerby in the area at the time of the murder, they declared to have spotted a couple loitering near the shop. Sketches of the suspects were drawn during the questioning of these eyewitnesses and the detectives immediately circulated the pictures all over South Carolina. The detectives speculated that the man was the one who shot the victims, Chris and Beverly, at the back, while the woman was distracting the two men, Scott and Brian, up front. When the man came to the front where the two men were, he shot them. This was just mere speculation by the detectives and none of the facts in this theory were proven. Months passed and police couldn't find any clue regarding the case. Extensive media coverage of the case started putting pressure into the detectives as they started to revisit the crime from a different perspective and, sure enough, a breakthrough appeared. Detectives started to do a thorough study of the victims' past and current lifestyles and those Scott, Beverly and Brian's backgrounds came out to be clean. It was not the same for the mechanic, Chris Sherbert. When detectives checked Chris' previous job, the news of a drug connection came into the picture. The detectives found out that Chris might have been involved with the wrong company and was also responsible for smuggling drugs. Moreover, Chris was scheduled to go to court the following Monday before the murder took place. It was 2003 when drug smuggling and abuse was increasing every single day and the police were hoping to arrest the key criminal players to eradicate the root cause of drug abuse, especially among young teens. The detectives and the public now started to wonder if this quadruple homicide took place with the motive to murder only Chris and the other three victims were just collateral damage. They even started to speculate that maybe the people involved in this drug business thought that Chris would give evidence against them in court on Monday and decided to end his life. The detectives said that this could be a possibility since Chris was the one who was shot first. However, regarding this path of speculation, no evidence was found by the police. Therefore, the investigation stalled again. Finally, after a whole year, the detectives approached the case from a completely different angle once again. The detectives found that Brian, Scott's friend and co-worker, was looking for a house weeks before the murder but strangely enough, his wife Robin had no idea regarding this decision taken by him. Later, Brian's mother, Lorraine Lucas, spoke of the unhappy and strained marriage between the pair and how Brian was planning to move out to live alone. 
Though this didn't seem to have a connection to the shooting, a discovery made by the detectives a few days later brought out a shocking revelation to the case. This quadruple homicide took the lives of four people and broke the hearts of many others. The victims' families were coping with the hard times, but it was especially hard for Melissa. Her life was perfect before it all came crashing down when her beloved husband was shot. Despite all this, Melissa knew she couldn't give up now that she had a new reason to continue living and that was her son. When Melissa's son, Scott Ponder Jr. was born in June 2004, Melissa was still being called upon by the police at intervals for interrogation. In one such incident, the police collected the DNA sample of Scott Jr. from a discharged diaper when Melissa had changed him at the station itself. The results of the DNA test left everyone dumbfounded. According to the reports, Scott Jr. was not the child of Scott but Brian since his DNA matched with Brian's found at the crime scene. This created tension between Melissa and her father-in-law, William Ponder, who kept asking her if this was true. The detectives started to approach this case from the point of a possible love triangle between Scott, Melissa and Brian. Questions about her being unfaithful to her husband spread all throughout the neighborhood. Moreover, Brian's mother stated that it was possible for Brian to have an affair considering how unhappy Brian was in his marriage and the thought of divorce might have crossed his head at times. Melissa was called multiple times to the police station for interrogation about her affair but she was resolute. She said that both she and Scott had struggled a lot to conceive this baby and Scott Jr. was undoubtedly Scott Ponder's child. She later told about how she was harassed every day by the same questions when she knew it was hers and Scott's baby. For the next year and a half, detectives kept track of every move made by Melissa in order to find a breakthrough. Finally, after 18 months, however, the detectives claimed that there must have been a mistake regarding the blood sample collected at the crime scene. The detectives stated that they'd conducted a DNA test for Beverly and Scott from the blood sample collected from the crime scene and the results did not match. In the reports, Brian's DNA matched Beverly's when clearly Scott was the son of Beverly. At this point, the detectives knew that they'd made a grave mistake. They'd put the wrong name in the blood sample of Scott and Brian collected from the crime scene since both the bodies of Scott and Brian were lying next to each other. This cleared up all the accusations laid against Melissa. Disregarding the love triangle theory, detectives now started to link the case with another homicide just 30 miles away that had happened just five months before the Superbike Motorsports homicide. On May 16, 2003, the people of Greer, South Carolina heard the news of a triple homicide that took place in the Blue Ridge Savings Bank. Sylvia Holtzclaw was on duty that day, though she had a day off. Soon, a local couple, E.B. and Maggie Barnes, visited the bank. At around 1.30 p.m., a 911 call went through to the Greer Police Department regarding a shooting that had taken place in the Blue Ridge Savings Bank where Sylvia, E.B., and Maggie were shot to death. Just like in the Superbike Motorsports, the shooting happened in broad daylight with no witnesses available. When police checked the CCTV footage, they saw a red car that was driving to the bank at around 1.24 p.m., and it was seen again when it was driving back from the bank, three minutes after the incident. Coincidentally, a similar red car was spotted during the quadruple homicide at the Superbike Motorsports. Detectives started to hunt down the red car and found a clue that it was stolen by 39-year-old Emerson Wright from a rental lot days before the homicide. The police concluded that he'd entered the bank to rob, but panicked and shot the couple when they tried to intervene. Unfortunately, the detectives never got to question Emerson regarding the bank and the Superbike Motorsports murder because of how incidents unfurled two years later in another car chase involving him and the Georgia State Police. He was wanted for a series of burglaries in the Atlanta area. When he was chased by the state trooper, he crashed his car, got out and shot himself with a single gunshot wound to his head. Later, the detectives declared that though there are similarities between the two cases, they didn't believe that the two cases were connected. Left with no clues or possible theories to continue their investigation, the quadruple homicide at the Superbike Motorsports turned into a cold case months later in 2004. For 13 years, Melissa, along with the other families of the victims, didn't stop with their efforts of finding any clue that might lead them to the person who is responsible for this atrocious crime, but to no avail. Finally, a ray of hope shone on them when the cold case of the quadruple murder that took place on November 6, 2003 in Superbike Motorsports reopened when the detectives got a breakthrough in the case in 2016, 13 years after the crime had been committed. 
The man behind the shooting came into the spotlight when he was arrested for a different murder that he'd committed. And during the interrogation, he confessed to the Superbike Motorsports quadruple murder. This man was 45-year-old Todd Kolhut. Todd was born on March 7, 1971, to mother Reggie Taig and father William Samsel. His parents divorced when he was two years old, and though he started to live with his mother and a new boyfriend, he wanted to spend more time with his biological father. Todd was extremely aggressive and hyper, at times not having self-resistance over his anger issues. He was a troublesome kid and showed hostility towards animals when he was in nursery school. He killed a goldfish with Clorox bleach and shot a dog with a BB gun. He spent three and a half months in Georgia Psychiatric Hospital, but there seemed to be no change in his aggressive behavior. His mother Reggie finally decided to send him to his father William, hoping a change in the environment would help his behavior. On November 25, 1986, now 15-year-old Todd planned the kidnapping of a 14-year-old girl named Christy Granado in Tempe, Arizona. He knocked on her door, threatened her with a 22 caliber revolver, and demanded for her to follow him to his house. He brought her to his home, tied her up, taped her mouth shut, and then proceeded to assault her. Afterwards, he walked her home and threatened to kill her entire family if she told anyone about what had happened. Christy, however, confessed everything to her parents, and her father called 911 immediately. Colehup was charged with kidnapping, sexual assault, and committing a dangerous crime against children. In 1987, he pleaded guilty to the kidnapping charge, and the other charges were dropped. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison and registered as a sex offender. When he was released, Todd was a changed man. He started to work for himself, and even got a job. No further complaints were heard against him until 2016. On August 31, 2016, 30-year-old Calla Brown and her boyfriend, the 32-year-old Charlie David Carver, went missing after they were last seen going to Todd's house to remove brush from one of Todd's properties. On November 3, 2016, investigators found Calla chained to a wall inside a metal storage container on the property of Todd. Later, investigators also retrieved the body of Charlie that had multiple gunshot wounds in it. Calla told the detectives that Todd shot Charlie and kept her chained up. He would always assault her in a barbaric manner and threatened her not to find ways to escape. Todd was immediately arrested by the police and taken in for questioning. During this arrest, Todd confessed to being the person behind the shooting that took place at the Superbike Motorsports 13 years earlier. When Todd was called in for the interrogation on November 5th, 2016, he started to tell the detectives everything that happened on November 6, 2003. He didn't confess out of fear or guilt, but merely as if recalling a memory. He said that he bought a Suzuki GSX R750 from Superbike Motorsports. But just days after buying the bike, he realized he couldn't ride it. Having no prior knowledge of riding a bike, Todd then decided to exchange the bike for another one that would be much easier to ride for a beginner such as Todd. He then told the detective that he was mocked by Scott and Brian for his inability to ride such a bike. The bike exchange didn't take place that day and Todd returned home. Fourteen days after the purchase, the bike got stolen from the front of the apartment complex where Todd lived. He filed a police complaint regarding the stolen bike, but the police never found the vehicle. Todd also mentioned that even the law enforcement officer made fun of him. He lost a thousand dollar deposit for insurance. But neither the police nor the shop contacted him after that regarding the stolen bike. Todd started college and went to Greenville Tech. His attraction towards bikes never faded, and soon he found himself going back to the Superbike Motorsports once again. He told the police that when he was browsing through the bikes in the shop, both Scott and Brian were giving negative remarks about him. Since then, whenever Todd visited the shop, the two men would mock and laugh at him. One day, he decided to take a Beretta 92 FS with him when he went to the shop. He waited for the customers to leave, and the shop was left with only Scott, Brian, Chris, and Beverly. Todd savagely shot all the victims to death. Though later he added that Beverly was not a target, she was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Hearing the confession made by Todd gave the victims' families the long-drawn justice and the closure that they were seeking for the past 13 years. Later, Todd also confessed to have killed three more people who were Johnny Joe and Megan Lee Coxie and Charlie David Carver. These three victims also died due to gunshots fired by Todd Kolhep. 
In the case of Todd Kolhup, even though it was a serial killer case, there was no trial that took place. Instead, prosecutors spoke to the families of those he'd murdered as well as to the survivor and decided to give him a plea deal instead of taking him to trial where the state offered Todd life without the possibility of parole, which he accepted only seven months after his arrest. Todd was sentenced to seven consecutive life sentences on May 23, 2017. In addition, he was sentenced to 30 years for sexual assault and 30 years for kidnapping. Not having a trial did not give the satisfaction to the victim's families regarding the justice that was needed to be served. It also angered the general public. It's not fair for families to wait years and years for justice, Seventh Circuit solicitor Barry Barnett later told reporters. But Scott Ponder's wife Melissa said that she was finally relieved to get closure regarding her husband's death after all these years. All the family members and relatives of the victims came together to hold a candlelight vigil in remembrance of their beloved ones whom they'd lost to the hands of a serial killer. After 13 drawn-out years of pain and suffering, the victims' families were grateful to finally learn what exactly happened to their loved ones. In one interview, Scott's wife Melissa did state that the reason Todd gave for murdering Scott and the others didn't sit right with her since she knew Scott well enough to know that he'd never make fun of someone and make them feel little in front of him. Nevertheless, she was grateful that justice had finally been served. The public was left disturbed by the lack of empathy and the casual behavior that Todd showed while being interrogated by the police or during his court appearances. They wanted Todd to receive the death penalty since he was a monster to society. Today's case was truly a twisted and disturbing one. Todd was truly a demon. To kill several people and not have an ounce of guilt is quite shocking. Moreover, Talking about the murders during interrogation as if revisiting a past memory was despicable. Saturday, May 4, 2019 began like just another day for 17-year-old Iman Nasir. The teenager from Manchester, England had recently become a new mom and was adjusting to this exciting phase. The day was uneventful until 17-year-old Rhett Cardi Shaw, father of the baby and her ex-boyfriend, called him on to tell her he was coming to visit her. The lovers had broken up and Rhett was seeing a new girl, Sarah Muhammad. Nevertheless, with the arrival of the baby, Iman and Rhett had again become close. A few minutes after the call, Rhett met Iman inside her room. The ex-lovers made love, but just minutes later, Rhett viciously stabbed Iman multiple times. What could have led Rhett to become violent all of a sudden? Was he high or was there a terrifying reason behind his actions? Iman Nasir was born in 2002 in Openshaw, Manchester. She grew up in a close-knit family with her two sisters and two brothers. As a devout follower of Islam, her family regularly attended the local mosque and instilled a strong sense of faith in Iman from a young age. Iman's personality shone through her intellect and charisma. She excelled academically and socially, made friends easily and was a dedicated sister to her siblings. She was so fond of babies that she dreamt of becoming a midwife one day. However, in 2013, Iman's life took a different turn when she met Rhett Cardi Shaw, her classmate in year 9 at Manchester Academy. The two hit it off and began dating. At first, Rhett seemed to be a caring and protective boyfriend, but with time he became controlling and abusive. He would flirt with other girls, cheat on her, lie to her and hit her whenever she questioned him. As Iman's relationship with Rhett grew increasingly violent, her vibrant social life began to dim. Once surrounded by friends, Iman became withdrawn and isolated, scared of upsetting Rhett but also afraid to leave him. Iman's friends and family noticed a distressing change in her behavior, but they could not separate the couple. Despite these challenges, Iman remained dedicated to her studies and earned good grades in high school. She was planning to go to college, where she hoped for a fresh start. At the age of 16, while in year 11 of high school, Iman's situation became more complicated when she found out she was pregnant with Rhett's child. This pregnancy clashed with her family's traditional expectations and her mother was disappointed and angry. But Iman wanted to keep the child and eventually her family accepted her decision and lent support. Red initially seemed happy about the baby and even told Iman that they would work things out. However, his excitement faded quickly and as the pregnancy progressed, he went back to his old ways. 
Iman was torn between her loyalty to Rhett and her love for the unborn child. Unknown to Iman, Rhett had begun a relationship with a fellow student in their class named Sarah Mohammed. Sarah had always desired Rhett, so when he asked her out, she seized her chance. However, upon learning of Iman's pregnancy, Sarah's jealousy flared into a vicious rage. Rhett, torn between the two women, opted for Sarah, leaving Iman to face her pregnancy alone. Iman took the breakup hard, but her baby gave her strength. In March 2019, she gave birth to a healthy baby boy, Keenan. Rhett was absent during the birth and remained distant, even though he visited to meet the baby. However, with the arrival of their child, Sarah's rage and jealousy intensified. Iman's continuing partnership with Rhett through the baby was unbearable to Sarah and her resentment soared to toxic new heights. Meanwhile, Iman was so occupied with her baby that she never once suspected the dark shadow looming over her. Though no longer dating, Iman and Rhett remained friends and would often see each other. When Sarah found out, she angrily broke up with Rhett, but he wasn't ready to give up on the relationship. On Friday, May 3, 2019, he had lunch with Sarah, hoping to persuade her to stay with him. The next day, on May 4, 2019, 17-year-old Rhett went to Iman's house to visit her while her mother was away, while Sarah waited for him outside. Initially, Rhett was friendly. He and Iman caught up on old times and made love, but suddenly his mood changed. He pulled out a large kitchen knife from his bag and attacked Iman. A struggle ensued and summoning her strength, Iman pushed him away and fled out into the garden, but he followed her and continued the attack, stabbing her brazenly on the face, neck, armpit, and three times in the back. While Iman lay bleeding and fighting for her life, Rhett fled the area and met up with Sarah. The two hugged and talked and quickly went back to Sarah's house, but what they didn't expect was that Iman would survive. One of her brothers had seen her bleeding in the garden and rushed her to the hospital. Rhett couldn't go far before the police caught him. He was apprehended and arrested at a bus stop, holding two bags containing blood-stained clothing and a bloody knife. Now in custody, the police began questioning him. From his answers and their investigation, the police were able to put together what happened. The tragic event was set in motion when Rhett and Sarah met for lunch on Friday, May 3, 2019. Sarah was furious that Rhett was still seeing Iman and wanted to break off their relationship. But when Rhett pleaded, Sarah agreed to get back, but on one condition. Sarah demanded that Rhett prove his love and commitment for her by killing Iman. She wanted him to work hard to win back her love. Rhett's phone record showed that after the meeting, he had been searching online for information about asphyxiation and the potential sentences for murder. The investigation revealed that Sarah had incessantly pressured Rhett, sending him repeated texts, instructing him to record his actions and share the footage as confirmation. Fortunately for Iman, Rhett's attempts at the plan had failed and her family rushed her to the hospital. Iman underwent multiple surgeries and remained hospitalized for four days. She had sustained severe injuries from 15 stab wounds. The doctors confirmed that given the severity of the assault, she was lucky to have survived. When Iman was questioned by police, she recounted that Red had asked disturbing questions during his visit that fateful day. He had asked if she would end her own life for him, if he should end hers, and how he should go about it. Red confessed to Iman that he was being coerced to end her life. He claimed that if he didn't comply, his family could be hurt. Red even asked her to fake being choked, so he could fabricate evidence of her death. He asked her to apply makeup to her neck to resemble a strangulation wound so he could photograph her. Iman reluctantly agreed, applying makeup to her neck and closing her eyes as he snapped the staged picture. However, when she opened her eyes, a horrifying sight awaited her. Rhett was holding a large kitchen knife. Scared, Iman tried to dial 999, but he forcibly prevented her from doing so. Fearing for her life, she asked him to leave. They began struggling and summoning her strength. Iman managed to escape from the room and out into the garden. It was there that Rhett finally attacked her with a knife, stabbing her over 15 times in the head, neck, and back. After the savage assault, Rhett quickly fled the scene. He had carried a set of clothes and sneakers to change out of the blood-stained clothing he wore during the attack, showing the extent of his planning. 
When he was arrested, the bags he carried contained the kitchen knife, a green sports bag, and clothes and sneakers stained with blood. There was also an open pack of dead all wipes, including used ones, presumably for cleaning the knife. 17-year-old Sarah Muhammad was arrested shortly thereafter. Her phone was confiscated, and on it were messages urging Rhett to be careful not to leave his DNA behind, as it would lead to prison. Further messages requested that he record the attack so she could see it before deleting the evidence and disposing of the phone. The detectives also learned that while Sarah was waiting outside Amon's house, she had bombarded Rhett with over 50 texts, actively encouraging his actions. Among these messages, one stood out saying, Why are you taking so long? Hurry up and do it. What followed next was a chilling series of messages that revealed the dark side of Rhett and Sarah's relationship. Rhett wrote back in response to Sarah, I did it to prove I love you. There was no other way to keep you. To this Sarah replied, I know there wasn't. I'm gonna protect you at all costs. As if that was not enough, she even offered to help him secure a new identity assuring him, I would have done the same for you. Investigators were shocked that teenagers in high school could be capable of such dark thoughts. Rhett Cardi Shaw was charged with attempted murder and possession of an offensive weapon, while his girlfriend, Sarah Muhammad, was charged with intentionally encouraging and assisting a person to commit murder. Rhett was also initially charged with assault based on the hospital's examination of Iman, but this charge was dropped when Iman confirmed it was consensual. Before the trial, Sarah Muhammad changed her name to Cairo Mori Akihiro. The trial was held in December 2019 at Manchester Crown Court, and a recovered Iman bravely faced her attackers as she gave testimony. During her testimony, Iman Nasir told the court how the event unfolded. On that fateful day, Iman had received a phone call from Rhett, saying he was on his way to her place. At that time, she was asleep inside the house. Her sisters were in the kitchen preparing food, while her mother had gone out with her newborn baby. When Red arrived at her doorstep, he was holding a green plastic bag and wearing black gloves. Inside the bag was a black Adidas hoodie and matching trousers. Red had claimed that he intended to donate these clothes to charity, but Aman wanted to look at them, which led to an argument. When she went back to her room, Red followed her and sat in the gaming chair and drew close to her. Iman told the court that he began touching her on her thighs and chest, kissing her neck and nose and face, and almost forcing himself on her. Though she felt angry at his attitude, she eventually gave in, and the two ended up having intimate relations in her bedroom. Later, their conversation took a disturbing turn as he began discussing her death. According to Iman, Red had stared into the mirror and made unsettling comments, including the threat to his family. Scared, she called out to her sister, but Rhett quickly quieted her down, claiming that he hadn't meant any harm. Then suddenly, the tone of the conversation changed again, as his phone beeped with a barrage of text messages. He emphasized that his threats were serious. Iman threatened to contact someone if he didn't reveal the messages, but Rhett tried to hide the messages from her as he read them. These messages, from Cairo Mori Sarah, gave the final push. The situation escalated from emotional distress to outright violence as Rhett began attacking Iman with a knife. Iman also shared insights into Cairo Mori's life, describing her as a demonic girl who was fascinated with dark and gothic themes. She called Cairo Mori a manipulative and delusional teenager who was unable to accept that Iman had been with Rhett before her. She believed Cairo Mori had been stalking her on social media, which contributed to her insecurity. Iman's testimony was emotionally charged as she recounted the painful ordeal. Iman explained how her life had been drastically altered, how she struggled to feel safe, or even sleep at night. She said rebuilding her life would be a challenge, as she was now forced to be a stay-at-home parent caring for her child. Iman did not even receive an apology from the perpetrators. He never considered that my son was just two months old at the time and I had recently undergone a C-section at 35 weeks. Nobody thought about me, she noted. Despite Iman's testimony, Cairo Mori, aka Sarah, disagreed with the court's version of events. She maintained her innocence, claiming that she believed Rhett was simply going to end his relationship with Iman. She explained her messages as wanting him to record their breakup on his phone as evidence of their separation. Needless to say, 
Her explanation moved no one. At various points during the court proceedings, Cairo Mori was seen smiling and even laughing. It was clear she felt no remorse. Rhett and Cairo Mori, who were both 17 years old at the time of the trial, were found guilty of all charges. During the sentencing, Judge Alan Conrad QC highlighted the warped personalities of Rhett and Cairo Mori, noting their dangerously narcissistic behaviors. The judge expressed disappointment at Cairo Mori's actions, emphasizing that the victim was a girl whom she had never met and who had caused her no harm. Even the defense team expressed deep sadness over the tragedy of the case, highlighting how the incomprehensible actions of the two teenagers had ruined their future. During the trial, the media was prohibited from naming them due to their age. However, following their conviction and in response to requests from the press, Judge Alan Conrad QC ordered that their names be made public. Iman Nasir also waived her anonymity rights as she wanted her story told. On Friday, December 20, 2019, Rhett Cardi Shaw received a 16-year prison sentence for attempted murder and possession of an offensive weapon. Cairo Mori Akihiro, formerly known as Sarah Muhammad, also received a 16-year prison sentence. She was convicted of intentionally encouraging or assisting a person to commit murder. After the teenagers had been convicted, Detective Inspector Jennifer Tattersaw from Greater Manchester Police applauded Iman's courage and resolve. The young woman who was left in a serious condition has been deeply impacted by this traumatic event. I commend her bravery and courage in coming forward to assist the police during the investigation. In her statement after the hearing, Iman Nasser expressed her satisfaction with the outcome, saying, I got the result I wanted to get. Her going down and getting jail is the outcome I wanted. She also thanked the police for their help and support and voiced her hope for a brighter future. I can now be happy and forget this ever happened. Even though justice has been done, the road ahead for Iman is challenging. The incident has profoundly reshaped her perspective on life. In an interview, she admitted that she now lives in constant fear that someone might pursue her to complete what Rhett and Cairo Mori had attempted. She revealed that her family had relocated from Openshaw due to the traumatic incident and her worsening mental health. She admitted that she was too scared to go out alone or even to be alone at home. Trusting anyone had become nearly impossible because if Rhett, the person she once loved, could do that to her. She felt anyone was capable of doing the same. Iman now relies on painkillers and antidepressants to cope with the lingering effects of her ordeal and often suffers from panic attacks at night. Nevertheless, Iman is hoping to start therapy soon and is determined to rebuild her life for the sake of her child. Iman Nasir's experience with a seemingly loving partner who turned violent highlights the importance of being vigilant and recognizing potential warning signs in relationships. This story takes us back to the year 1991, with a young woman named Julie Dart. Born on March 1, 1973, Julie had a rather difficult upbringing and often found herself in trouble, even from a very young age. This was typically through spending money that she'd never had, and often getting herself into large sums of debt, and moving into the year 1991, she yet again found herself to be down on her luck. Barely an adult and with no career, she was left with the heartbreaking decision to work the streets of Leeds, taking to the red light district in Chapel Town to try and salvage her ever-growing debt. At the time, her family had no idea what was going on. Instead, Julie would tell them that she was working long hours at the hospital. Her family were none the wiser, and unfortunately, it would only become evident that things were not as they seemed in mid-July 1991, and that realization came in the worst way possible. Julie had suddenly disappeared, and although it was rather typical for her to be silent for a day or two, her family started to worry after several days. Things took an evil turn on July 12th, when her boyfriend Dominic received a strange letter through the post, and apparently it was written by Julie. Within this letter, she wrote that she'd been kidnapped and now feared for her life, and although she was being offered food, she hadn't eaten in multiple days. She ended the letter by saying that he had until Monday to alert her mother and the authorities. Her abductor was asking for £140,000. Members of Julie's family were able to confirm that the handwriting was in fact hers, but something seemed off about it. It seemed to be messy and haphazard. 
Soon after, the authorities started analyzing it for any clues they could find, and that was when another letter came through. This one indicated a drop-off point for the ransom money. The letter requested that they deliver it to New Street Station in Birmingham, found miles away from home. The letter further demanded that they wait for a phone call at the payphone on Platform 9. The authorities complied with this request, and when the payphone rang at precisely 7 p.m., they knew it was her abductor. But unfortunately, the call didn't quite go to plan. After picking up the phone, the undercover officer was met with absolute silence. Furthermore, nobody arrived to collect the money, and no further correspondence was made. While the authorities had complied with the demands in hopes of rescuing Julie, little did they know that, tragically, it was already too late. And on July 19, 1991, officers received reports of a suspicious-looking pile in a field, found in the town of Easton in Lincolnshire. Sadly, these reports would end in terrible news. Wrapped in this bundle of sheets was Julie's lifeless body. She was bound with duct tape and had suffered blunt force trauma to the head. Forensics determined that she had been dead for roughly four or five days already, meaning that, at the time of the negotiations, she had already been murdered. The news was sure to leave her family devastated, and to compound to the pain and grief in her loss, they had no idea who murdered Julie. At this point, it wasn't clear whether her abductor had any intention of handing her over alive or dead, and while his motives would eventually come to light, it currently wasn't obvious. The callous way in which Julie was found indicated that her killer was either sophisticated or interested in permanently concealing her body. But the callousness would not stop there, because shortly after, the authorities would receive a second letter, this time written using a typewriter, and its author was now far more demanding. Once again, he was demanding money from the authorities, threatening that if they failed to comply to his actions, then many more prostitutes would die. The letter went on to say that Julie had died from three blows to the head before being strangled, and with such dreadful accuracy, it was sure that this letter was linked to her killer. Back then, it was typical for the police to cooperate with a killer via personal ad spaces and local newspapers. In this instance, the officers did this to confirm that they would pay him, and shortly after doing so, the authorities received yet another letter. This cat and mouse chase would go on for several more months, with Julie's killer even teasing the authorities by sending in handwritten letters over time. Despite their best efforts, detectives were still none the finding their suspect, and this would apply tremendous pressure on them too. With fresh threats against other women being persistent through these letters, it meant that no one in the Midlands was safe. Their devious pen pal even threatened to derail a passenger train if they didn't send him the money. Undoubtedly, he seemed to enjoy the power of toying with the police. Our story would develop yet again in January 1992, when the authorities received a phone call from a local estate agent. They had called the authorities to report that, after one of their agents had left to show someone a property, she never returned. The home was located on Turnberry Road, which can be found north of Birmingham. Stephanie Slater, who was born and raised in Birmingham, was 25 years old at the time, and still lived with her parents. At the time, she had a steady relationship with her boyfriend, and the two had recently booked a holiday to the Isle of Wight, which is one of Stephanie's favorite places. Hoping to pay off the holiday, she had picked this job up only a few weeks prior. Despite her recent start, she was already known to be a pleasant, reliable, and punctual worker, which of course made her sudden disappearance that much more concerning to her manager. And then, just a few hours later, her manager received a tape through the front door. Playing the tape immediately, he heard Stephanie's voice on the end of the recorder. Within this tape, she said, this is Stephanie Slater. The time is 11.45. I assure you I am okay and unharmed, and providing these instructions are carried out, I will be released on Friday the 31st of January. Her manager informed the authorities immediately, who instantly became aware that Stephanie's disappearance was likely linked to the same man who murdered Julie. Despite this knowledge, they had very little evidence to work with. DNA and forensic methods were still very primitive back then, and they had to rely on more traditional ways to get by. Police began their search of the property, and what they found wasn't good. Blood was present on the bathroom walls, which was later confirmed to belong to Stephanie. If the authorities had any chance to get Stephanie back home alive, then they knew that they had to act fast. After all, Julie's killer had already proven himself to be rather impatient. 
The videotape demanded that her supervisor and manager, Kevin Watts, would be the one to drop the money off for her, and thankfully, he was willing to comply. On January 27, 1992, Kevin was instructed to travel north to Glossop train station, and then asked to follow various clues. This included meeting a planted woman at the train station, various phone calls scattered through public phone boxes, and a long drive down a dark road, eventually leading him to a secluded bridge in the fog. And then, while under the cover of darkness, Kevin found himself in front of a tray which had been placed on the wall of the abandoned railway bridge. He was instructed to drop the money into it, and then moments later, the string was pulled and it disappeared into the fog. Although he was in constant contact with the authorities, and had even been tailed by dozens of officers, the money slipped off the edge of the bridge and then into darkness. And just like that, her kidnapper was once again lost to the night. Stephanie's abductor remained silent that evening, leaving her family on the edge of their seats in desperate hope that she may be released. And that is when, only a few hours later there was a knock at the front door. Undercover officers opened the door to a dazed yet alive Stephanie Slater. Despite their grave concerns, her kidnapper had remained true to his word. And although she appeared to be in an agitated frame of mind, she was otherwise relatively healthy. An interview with officers would reveal some stark details. According to Stephanie, her abductor was a man in his 40s who used a fake name to visit the property. While showing him around the home, she then walked into the bathroom. That was when he hit her over the head with a hammer, bound and blindfolded her, and then took her to his car. The next thing Stephanie knew, she found herself in what she could only describe as a damp cellar. The room was dark, musky and cold, and precisely the sort of place you'd expect to be murdered. Sadly, she was then asked to strip before being assaulted by her assailant. After that, she was placed inside a wooden coffin, which was then placed inside a capsized bin. During her time of imprisonment, Stephanie was left inside of this confined area. She was only allowed out to be given life-sustaining food, was kept naked, and was unable to bathe. Now, despite these terrible conditions, Stephanie made use of her kind and calming nature to appeal to her assailant, smiling, joking, and even laughing a few times to humanize herself. This sort of clever manipulation likely made her more impressionable to her assailant, helping him develop feelings and helping her avoid her murder. Stephanie recorded voice notes, wrote letters, and gave in to whatever demands he wanted from her, all while being told that, as long as she and her people outside complied, she would eventually be set free. It would seem that her brave efforts to comply with the man would eventually pay off. Even after receiving the ransom money, Stephanie seemed to comply to her monster, and eventually, as promised, she was set free, despite this being a significant risk to her kidnapper. Only 12 hours after her release, Stephanie was asked to make a public announcement. She appeared to be dazed, drugged, and distressed, and following her statement, it seemed that her kidnapper had become quite nervous about the situation. Unknown to him at the time, but he was still out of sight from detectives. But after letting his nerves get the better of him, this wouldn't last for long. In response to the public announcement, he called her employer once more to threaten them. However, little did he know that a recording device had been implanted into the landline, and that, furthermore, every word that came out of his mouth was recorded for the rest of the world to hear. After exhausting all other avenues, the authorities decided to use this voice recording against him. The man was still faceless, but at least he wasn't without a voice. On February 20th, 1992, the BBC released this phone call on an episode of Crime Watch, attaching his voice to an artist's impression of the man that Stephanie had orchestrated. And surprisingly, one of those watching this episode was haunted to recognize his voice as no one other than her ex-husband, Michael Sams. At the time, this man was 41 years old and living in Sutton-on-Trent in Nottinghamshire. Michael was previously in the army, but now was a service engineer who repaired central heating systems. According to his ex-wife, she was not surprised by his actions either. Apparently, he had already tried to extort money illegally, with his first crime in 1978, when he stole a car to commit insurance fraud. While in prison for this, he was diagnosed with cancer, which unfortunately led to the amputation of his leg. It turns out that our kidnapper was actually physically disabled, making his story of being a kidnapper a little more unusual. Unfortunately, his time in prison would not deter him from carrying on a life of extortion.
He would often threaten train companies in derailing the passenger trains, and even threaten to poison food at local supermarkets if they didn't give in to his demands. Michael had already been married twice, had two children, and now lived with his third wife in a shared cottage. And after being identified as a perfect fit for the suspect, he was swiftly arrested on charges of the murder of Julie Dart and the abduction of Stephanie Slater. Moving forward, it didn't take long for Stephanie to positively identify him as her assailant. And it's here that the true horrors of Michael Sams finally came to light. After his identification, the authorities made their way to his property. And after looking in the back garden, there they found an old building called his workshop. It was here that they witnessed a dark, messy, damp room, which was soon confirmed to be the same location that Stephanie had been held in for eight long days. It was later revealed that during this time frame, he even attached electrodes to her, and threatened to electrocute her if she escaped. No surprise, he was also accused of abducting and murdering Julie Dart. And although he initially denied these allegations, forensics would later confirm that she had been in the exact same room. Clothing found over her body contained yellow fibers that positively matched the carpet found in his workshop, meaning that there was next to no doubt that he was in fact her murderer. Michael Sams eventually stood trial in 1993, and although he would plead guilty to kidnapping Stephanie Slater, he denied any involvement in Julie's murder. The prosecution claimed that he used Julie as a practice run, using vulnerable women as bargaining chips for his own personal profit. This was substantiated by the fact that she had been murdered before any contact with the outside world. Michael had never intended to release her, he was merely testing the waters. Although Michael continued to deny these claims, forensic evidence would suggest otherwise, and thankfully, all of his efforts would be in vain. On July 8, 1993, he was found guilty of kidnapping Stephanie Slater and murdering Julie Dart. As a result, he was given a life sentence. He was further tried for his crimes of blackmail and extortion, including four separate charges against British Rail, and several against the police. He was found guilty of all four instances of blackmail, and given an additional 10 years for each. Just three days after his verdict, he decided to come clean and confess Julie's murder. He requested to see the senior investigating police officer, where he then went into graphic detail about the crime. He further claimed that his confession was motivated by sparing Julie's mother from any more heartbreak. He said, I've been going over it and thinking it's only fair that she knows I did it. I mean, I obviously did do it. What can I tell her? I do feel sorry for her. Despite his confession, Michael continued to be a monster. Just two years later, in 1995, he attacked a female parole officer with a metal spike, adding eight years to his sentence. Robin Marie Cornell was born on the 30th of November, 1978 to Jan Cornell a single mother who worked at the Cape Coral Hospital. In 1990, the 11-year-old was a student at Tropic Isles Elementary School in Cape Coral. Robin was a tomboy who beat the boys at sports and games. She was a happy, easygoing fifth grader who did well in school and never balked, no matter how tough the situation was. Robin had an older sister, Jan's first daughter, who left home after an argument with her mother. Jan and Lisa Story were close friends and they both worked at the Cape Coral Medical Center. Lisa's eldest sister, Susan Gibson, described her as someone who liked to motorcycle and had a passion for photography, among other things. Despite a promising life ahead for both, these two would have their lives cut short by a killer who remained elusive for decades. Jan had welcomed her friend and co-worker at Cape Coral Hospital, Lisa Story, as a roommate in her condo on the 9th of May 1990 a day before the murder. With Lisa at home, Jan had the chance to visit her then-boyfriend, now-husband, Donnie Batista, to watch a basketball game. Because it was late, Jan didn't feel like leaving home at first. She was encouraged by Lisa to go have fun with her boyfriend since she could babysit Robin. Jan Cornell recalled that the last thing she told her daughter was, I'm going to Donnie's, I love you. In the early hours of May 10, 1990, Jan returned home and was met with a disturbing scene that haunted her for years. Her front door was bolted, even though she'd instructed her roommate not to use the deadbolt on the door since she only had a key. Jan heard footsteps initially, thinking someone was approaching the door. 
But after waiting without seeing anyone, she went to the back door and found it open. She entered the house to see her usually tidy home, a complete mess. Cabinets were open, clothes were strewn on the floor as if someone had raided the apartment. Picture frames of her daughter Robin and her elder sister were left side by side on the ironing board. Something about the placement sent chills to her spine. She leapt up the stairs with a sickening feeling in her gut, screaming for her child. On getting to the room, she found her daughter lying face down on the bedroom floor, a pillow propping her torso, nightdress pushed to the neck, her body cold and bloody. Jan, with the desperation of a mother hoping for a miracle, tried to revive the girl even when rigor mortis had obviously set in. I knew she was dead, Jan recounted. As someone who worked in the medical field herself, she noticed that rigor mortis had already begun. Jan's neighbor, Madeline Munch, vividly remembered being woken up that fateful day by loud screams from next door. Lisa was also found dead in another room, having gone through the same fate as Robin, as the investigators would later reveal. The CCPD's first line of action was to take the bodies for autopsies. With the procedure, even more gruesome details of the circumstances of death were revealed. Not only had the killer snuffed life out of his victims by suffocation, his indignity toward them continued after death. This murderer had assaulted the bodies of his victims after killing them. While the killer was still unknown, he'd left his marks on the scene. His bodily fluid was found on Robin's bedsheets and in her body. As several years passed, leads dwindled, and hopes of finding the killer grew dimmer by the day, but the police never gave up. Despite years of searching with leads turning into dead ends, the Cape Coral Police Department continued in their search. The police investigated all those close to Robin and 32-year-old Lisa while also focusing on the community. They came up with 19 neighbors as possible suspects. One of the 19 initial suspects, according to his ex-girlfriend, exhibited suspicious behavior and fled the town shortly after the investigation began. His hair was reported to match the hair found on the victim's bodies. Surprisingly, he wasn't arrested. Although Cornell initially wanted to cremate her daughter after her passing, she was advised to keep the body preserved for potential forensic investigation. In 2010, officials eventually released her daughter's body to her explaining that it could no longer be used for investigative purposes. In 2015, a flicker of hope appeared when the CCPD received a multi-page letter finally pointing toward a possible suspect. The writer explained in detail how and why they named the suspect, causing the detectives to pursue the lead and investigate the named person. It was probably the most excited that I've gotten on any tips or calls that have come in, Ellis said. Jan who had family members in law enforcement, received advice not to get excited by the process. Over the years, as various leads surfaced and different detectives worked on the case, Jan learned to keep an open mind to prevent feeling overwhelmed by disappointment when those leads ended in dead ends. Nevertheless, she admitted that she couldn't help but hold her breath every time she received a call from the police department. With all the evidence gathered, the only thing left was to match the suspect's DNA to the one found at the scene. A major breakthrough seemed imminent. Unfortunately, this hope was quickly dashed as the testing revealed that the DNA did not match the named suspect. It was not our guy, Ellis said. On the 2016 anniversary of Lisa and Robin's death, the CCPD revealed that Detective Christy Joe Ellis had been working the old case for the last several years. We firmly believe that this is solvable. Ellis said. It's just going to take that right information. Every year, the CCPD worked to raise public awareness of the case, hoping to trigger someone's memory and solve the murder. In 2016, a digital billboard on College Parkway in Fort Myers displayed information about the double homicide. Jen also refused to give up on finding the killer of her daughter and friend. Detective Ellis particularly applauded Jan for her tenacity stating that she was always available on speed dial and was able to recall people from that time and help put pieces of evidence into context. The death of Lisa and Robin shocked the erstwhile peaceful close-knit condominium community. The incident left Jan herself with a sense of mistrust for the neighbors after no one came out to give information on how her daughter ended up dead over the night. In an interview with the Cape Coral Police Department in 2013, 
Jan said she was convinced in her heart that someone in the community knew something about the case and was withholding the details. The killer would not be caught till decades after his heinous crimes. 26 years after the mysterious murder, a certain 54-year-old Joseph Zeller was arrested by police for shooting his stepson with a pellet gun on August 27, 2016. He was charged with assault and received a five-year prison sentence in Lee County Jail. During this time, his DNA was collected and added to the national database. This presented the CCPD another opportunity to connect a killer to the unsolved murder case. With the routine checks done on the database, finally a match was made. The CCPD swung into action a day after the discovery and began to question Zeller. He acted evasively and stated that he'd lost most of his memories prior to 1998 due to a motorcycle accident. However, there was no proof of his memory loss and with the DNA evidence pointing towards him, he was charged with the double murders and put on trial. For Jan, when she was finally told the killer's DNA had been matched through the database, she could barely believe her ears. She kept on repeating, oh my god, for 45 minutes. She said, I knew justice would come. I've prayed for this every day for 26 years and could never let go of how he tortured and killed my baby and my friend, Cornell told reporters. Prosecutors said during opening statements that the bodily fluid that was found on the bedsheet where Robin was sleeping matched with Zeller to a frequency of 1 over 700 billion. Even before the trial commenced, Zeller had sent threatening letters to Cornell warning that he'd make her life miserable by dragging her through the entire American court system if she didn't stop investigation into the murders. He was also charged with witness tampering in connection with these letters. Throughout the homicide trial, which began on May 8, 2023, Zeller displayed an aggressive demeanor. He was not only violent towards his own attorney but also exhibited rudeness and a blatant disregard for the court and the jury who held his fate in their hands. His unsettling and disruptive behavior appeared intentional, aimed at creating an atmosphere of fear in the courtroom and making trial attendees uncomfortable. At the beginning of his trial at the Lee County Courthouse, Joseph Zeller sent a chilling message to viewers by scrawling the word killer on poorly fitting veneers. He proceeded to flash his teeth while locking his gaze with the cameras. During another court appearance, the 61-year-old man even raised his middle finger at the entire court. Defense attorney Lee Hollander told reporters that Zeller's conduct on the stand did not help his case. According to him, seeing Zeller's antics while he was on the witness chair was like watching a train wreck. While testifying during his defense, Zeller made the shocking claim that his DNA was present at the crime scene because he had intimate relations with Jan Cornell several months before the double homicide. Prosecutors countered this claim, stating that it was impossible for his bodily fluid to remain detectable long after the alleged encounter. Zeller then called the victim's mother a pig who never washed her sheets. Jan expressed disgust at the outrageous allegations, categorically stating that she had never met her daughter's killer prior to his arrest. She also noted how Zeller carried himself with a pitiless arrogance throughout the trial. The murderer would often lock eyes with her from the defense table and while on the stand as an intimidation tactic. During his sentencing in June 2023, Zila displayed an unprovoked act of aggression towards his own attorney, Kevin Shirley. Zila had initially gestured as if to whisper something to Shirley, but then suddenly elbowed the lawyer in the face without apparent cause. This action prompted immediate intervention by court bailiffs who had to tackle and restrain Zila. Dr. Julie Harper, the psychologist who evaluated Zeller over the course of three sessions, noted that a combination of current health problems and childhood trauma could explain much of his past and present violent behavior. She said there was a concern because Zeller's father was much older than his mother. The prosecutor's arguments hinged on three pieces of evidence, which they tagged the big three. These were Robin Cornell, a pillow, and a sheet. In the closing address, the state prosecutors presented key points they needed to establish for the possibility of the death penalty. They argued that the murders were deliberate and that Sealer had the choice to spare Robin and Lisa's lives but chose not to. Considering the overwhelming evidence against him, the Florida jury delivered the guilty verdict on two counts of first-degree murder against Sealer on May 18, 2023. Jurors voted 10-2 in recommendation of a death sentence 
with the other two voting in favor of at least 25 years imprisonment. Zilo was finally sentenced to death on June 26, 2023. Daniel Burroughs was born on November 6, 1946 in Sheldon, Texas, the son of Louise Florio Wintersick. Daniel grew up alongside his sister, Janine Burroughs Gallagher, in the heart of Delaware County, Pennsylvania. Early in his life, circumstances led them to relocate to New Jersey, where his mother remarried Raymond J. Wintersick. His half-brother, Raymond J. Wintersick III, soon became his best friend. From a young age, Daniel showed a remarkable talent for craftsmanship. His hands had a magical touch. Daniel's abilities ranged from custom automotive paintwork to constructing homes. Though he didn't have a traditional job, his talent for car repairs and renovations kept him busy and fulfilled. Daniel went to high school in 1960, where he met Loretta Dale, his high school sweetheart. They went through the ups and downs of teenage love, both Daniel and Loretta were known for their amiable and pleasant personalities. While they did date during high school, it was not a serious relationship. Unexpectedly, they went their separate ways after school and lost touch for many years. Both Daniel and Loretta moved on and married different people. However, they both divorced their partners in 1970. Nevertheless, Loretta found love and remarried. Unfortunately, her second husband passed away in February 1994. Not long after, Loretta and Daniel found each other again. Their bond rekindled and they started dating again. After dating for three years, the high school sweethearts decided to tie the knot in 1997. The couple settled in May's Landing, New Jersey, and everything appeared wonderful. They blended their families with both of them having children from previous marriages and Loretta even having four grandchildren. Daniel was a loving father to his two children, Carolyn and Danny Jr., and a doting grandfather to Amanda Costa. The marriage was not as simple as it seemed. As time passed, the outwardly smooth relationship started having challenges beneath the surface. On August 3, 2007, Daniel disappeared from the couple's home. Loretta said that Daniel had left with a younger blonde woman in a yellow Hummer. According to Loretta, the woman was a waitress from Florida whom they'd met during their vacation at a restaurant. Daniel became infatuated with the place, and they ended up dining there nearly every day of their vacation. Once they returned home, Loretta embarked on another vacation with her daughter's family. When she returned, she was shocked to see Daniel in their driveway with the woman from Florida. While she was still trying to understand what was going on, Daniel announced that he was going to Florida, the Sunshine State, with her. Loretta maintained that Daniel had always wanted to move and retire in Florida, a plan she was against because of her grandchildren who lived nearby. Their differing views on retirement plans strained their relationship. After Daniel's abrupt move, Laura was heartbroken and wanted to get back at him. She wanted to sell their house, but because the property was jointly owned by Daniel and Loretta, she couldn't sell it without divorcing him. However, instead, she organized a yard sale to sell off Daniel's belongings. Not surprisingly, this move infuriated and raised suspicions among Daniel's friends and family. Daniel's close friend, Robert Valiente Jr., was puzzled because he knew Daniel cherished his tools for his projects and it seemed unusual for him to abandon them. Robert confronted Loretta about the yard sale and the abandoned tools, but Loretta claimed that Daniel wasn't keeping any of his old belongings and didn't want to take them to Florida. Even Daniel's brother and best friend, Raymond, found the situation suspicious. Daniel hadn't shared his new address, or even informed him of his move to Florida, something they would ordinarily discuss regularly. Daniel's sudden and unexpected departure left those close to him baffled and concerned. They felt that the story didn't add up, yet they had no evidence to contradict her story. However, they couldn't just move on without trying to find out where Daniel went and who the mystery girl was that made him abandon everything and disappear without a word to anyone. The next month, on September 1, 2007, Raymond drove from his home in Pennsylvania to visit Loretta. He also officially reported Daniel missing to the police. 
law enforcement initiated a search for Daniel in local databases, particularly in Florida where he was said to have gone, but they found no traces or leads. The detectives conducted interviews with Loretta, who was cooperative throughout the process. They also conducted a thorough search of her house and property, yet nothing appeared suspicious or out of place. During their investigation, detectives dug into Loretta's history and discovered a past embezzlement case. It appeared that around a decade earlier, Loretta had embezzled approximately half a million dollars from her workplace. It turned out that prior to her marriage to Daniel in 1997, she was convicted of embezzling in excess of $470,000 from a Yedin Electrical Products company, leading to a 15-month federal prison term. When the police presented the evidence to her, Loretta claimed she was unfairly targeted by her company when others were involved. She admitted that it was a secret she was afraid to share with Daniel. Surprisingly, Daniel had visited her in prison regularly for over a year, but she was not entirely honest to Daniel about why she was in prison. Daniel's friend and neighbor, Ronald Roberts, also reported some concerning observations. He told the investigators that he noticed dirt on Loretta's hands and clothing during their interaction and detected a foul odor, but that she attributed it to a dead animal. Additionally, he observed that a broken trellis had recently been repaired. Despite these suspicions, Loretta always had an explanation at the ready. Frustratingly, the lack of concrete evidence left the police unable to make an arrest, and Daniel's case gradually grew cold. In February 2009, Loretta took a significant step in her life by filing for divorce from Daniel. Enough time had passed now, and she felt justified to divorce him and sell the house. A notice was published in the newspaper to formalize the process. However, when the court hearing arrived, Daniel was absent. Loretta's plan was to sell their house in May's Landing and relocate to Venner City to be nearer to her daughter and sister. In February 2010, Daniel Burroughs' family successfully convinced investigators to reopen the case after the local police formed a cold case unit in the county. The family also created a Facebook page called Find Daniel Burroughs. In the pages about section, Raymond, Daniel's brother, noted that Loretta's claim that Daniel had left with another woman, leaving all his possessions behind, was very suspicious. The case took an unusual turn in February 2013 when Raymond, frustrated with the lack of progress in his brother's case, contacted the police. Loretta's account of events never quite added up, particularly the story about Daniel leaving with another woman in a yellow Hummer, which no witnesses could confirm. He hinted that Daniel's probably dead and Loretta might be responsible. Loretta was stunned by the accusations of her killing her husband. She maintained that Daniel had run away with a younger woman but the lack of any concrete evidence to prove either account left police nowhere. However, Raymond was determined to prove that something just wasn't right. He urged the detectives to look into the strange death of Loretta's first husband. Investigators were intrigued and decided to investigate the circumstances surrounding the death of Loretta's ex-husband. There were suspicions among both family members and friends that Loretta had had a hand in his death. The events leading to his demise were troubling. After a period of separation, Loretta and her former husband rekindled their relationship for about a week before tragedy struck and he tragically overdosed. What further deepened the suspicions was that Loretta had been responsible for administering his medications during this period. Adding to the concerns, the police discovered that Loretta had received a sizable sum of money following his death. However, contrary to expectations, she didn't share any portion of it with his children. This raised red flags and added weight to the notion that something was off about the circumstances surrounding his death. Authorities began to feel that Loretta's involvement went beyond what appeared on the surface. It seemed the circumstances were similar to Daniel's case too. However, despite their growing suspicions, the police knew that without Daniel's body, they couldn't build a case for murder. However, they did come across a potentially significant piece of evidence a power of attorney document signed by Daniel. Upon closer examination, this document appeared to be suspiciously fake. It had been created on June 12, 2007 and had been legalized by an acquaintance of Loretta's, raising even more questions about the events surrounding Daniel's disappearance. 
It became evident that Loretta's primary motive was the valuable house. The house was worth a huge sum of money, and she was desperate to cash out. Investigators realized that there was more to this case than met the eye and they were determined to find out what had really happened to Daniel. Early in the morning of May 17, 2013, the investigators, led by Sergeant Lynn Doherty of the Atlantic County Prosecutor's Office, obtained search warrants for Loretta's house and the residence where she'd been staying with her sister. The search warrants were carried out simultaneously leaving Loretta with no opportunity to tamper with or destroy potential evidence. Loretta seemed to have an idea about why the police were there. Upon their arrival, she anxiously asked if they were planning to search her house in Venice City. When Sergeant Lynn Doherty confirmed that they were searching all her houses, the color drained from her face, and she became very nervous. During the search of one of the bedrooms in Venice City, Detective Caroline McDonald made a strange discovery. There were large Tupperware containers carefully stacked and concealed in the closet. Strangely, these were the only items in the house organized this way. Moreover, they noticed air freshener beads and dryer sheets placed on top of these containers. As soon as the containers were opened, the unmistakable stench of decomposition filled the air. To their horror, investigators found bones meticulously separated into two containers and a skull concealed within a woman's handbag inside the containers. Loretta was subsequently arrested and taken in for questioning. At the police station, she tearfully confessed to Daniel's murder, revealing that his remains were, indeed, hidden in the closet of her Venner house. However, Loretta presented a story of domestic abuse. She claimed that she'd killed Daniel in self-defense. According to her account, they had a heated argument, during which she retreated to the kitchen and grabbed a knife. Loretta alleged that Daniel had aggressively lunged at her, resulting in him accidentally impaling himself with the knife. She admitted to placing Daniel's lifeless body in the bathtub after the supposed incident. When questioned by detectives about why she didn't call 911 immediately, Loretta provided a disturbing explanation. She said that she'd left Daniel's body in the bathtub and proceeded to go on vacation. When she returned home, she described how she moved his remains into the containers. Later, she buried these containers, but notably, Loretta confessed to digging them up and carrying them with her wherever she went when she relocated. The tragic truth about Daniel Burroughs was finally unraveled. Loretta was charged with murder and preventing her arrest. In court, Loretta initially showed little emotion, but during the testimonies, she cracked and began crying. The testimonies began with Dr. Charles F. Siebert Jr., a forensic pathologist. Dr. Charles was the one who opened the containers. He testified that they were covered in nine layers of plastic bags arranged in alternating directions. He also noted the presence of dryer sheets, air fresheners, and scented beads, evidently used to mask the odor of decay. Upon opening the first container, Dr. Charles found a woman's handbag. Its color had been changed by the decomposition fluid. Inside this bag, he discovered a cranium and mandible, a skull and jawbone. The second larger plastic container contained more skeletal remains, including the left upper arm and lower legs. Dr. Charles noted cut marks on the ribs consistent with stab wounds, leading him to conclude that the individual had met a violent end and confirming a homicide. After Charles finished with his testimony, Stuart Alexander, a forensic odontologist, took the stand. He positively identified the remains in the plastic tote as those of Daniel Burroughs. He compared Burroughs' dental records to the teeth found in the skull. Donna Fontana, a forensic anthropologist from the New Jersey State Police, also testified about the condition of the bones within the boxes. Donna Fontana showed the condition of the bones using a replica of a human skeleton and accompanying photographs, providing a visual aid for the jury. She highlighted that the right tibia, a significant bone in the lower leg, contained clear signs of being cut with a knife and saw. The consistent color of the cut edge with the bone indicated that the cut occurred at or around the time of death. Examining the ribs, she noted that several bones were missing, and those displaying trauma bore injuries consistent with knife wounds, with one rib being completely fractured. Fontana emphasized a pattern of dismemberment explaining that this gruesome act is typically done to prevent identification and facilitate ease of transportation. On August 3, 
2007, Daniel vanished. Loretta claimed he'd left for a younger woman in a yellow Hummer, but the prosecution believed she'd plotted his murder for months. In early June 2007, Loretta asked lawyer Enid Heiberg to draft a power of attorney, claiming she and her husband were selling their home while he was away. Heiberg, grateful for Loretta's kindness, did it for free. Loretta needed a notarized power of attorney and turned to Edward Dwyer, who helped her create one in June 2007. Loretta signed it in her husband's name without his consent. Loretta's daughter, Nicole Di Domizio, witnessed this forgery. After her husband Daniel's death, Loretta used a fake document to sell their home for $77,000, with half belonging to Daniel. To access the funds, she initiated a divorce in February 2009, claiming Daniel had moved to Florida without an address. Her divorce attorney, Daniel Alsafram, published a notice of the complaint in the press of Atlantic City. Loretta received half the money during the divorce process, and the rest at its finalization. The prosecutor pointed out that, including the sale of Daniel's house and belongings, Loretta gained nearly $100,000. In his closing statement, Levy noted that Loretta had evaded justice for over eight years, leaving nothing but Daniel's remains. The story concludes with Loretta $100,000 richer and Daniel Burroughs hidden in her closet. After two hours of deliberation, the jury found Loretta Burroughs guilty of first-degree murder for stabbing her husband to death, chopping up his body with a knife and a saw, packing it in two plastic totes, and dragging it with her as she moved three times in six years. On March 17, 2015, Loretta was convicted and sentenced to 55 years in prison, an additional three years were added for hindering apprehension. She'll be eligible for parole in 2060 when she's 108 years old. The tragic case of Tara Brown, a young mother whose life was cut short by domestic violence at the hands of her ex-partner, Liano Padia. Tara's story sheds light on the urgent need for a more effective response to domestic violence cases and proper training within law enforcement agencies. Tara Brown was born on March 21, 1991, in Hamilton, New Zealand and moved to the Gold Coast with her family as a teenager. Fast forward to 2011, Tara fell for Liano John Padilla, a Banditos gang member. A year later, they welcomed a beautiful daughter into their lives, whose name will be kept under wraps for privacy. Tara embodied the spirit of the Gold Coast, the sunshine, the golden beaches, and the warmth of community. Growing up in this coastal haven, Tara developed a passion for life and adventure. She also played touch football at a representative level. Tara had an insatiable curiosity, a zest for exploring the world around her. Being a mother was her proudest role, and she approached it with all the love and dedication in her heart. Tara's face lit up every time her daughter was mentioned. The love she felt was palpable, in her smiles, her laughter, in everything she did. In the midst of her vivacity and the love that enveloped her world, the shadows of fate were lurking, waiting to cast a pall over her sunny days. Leonel Padia was a former member of the Banditos gang. He had a history of domestic violence and criminal offending, and had been in and out of prison in the years leading up to the murder. His journey into criminality commenced in 2009, with charges ranging from assault to possession of stolen property. Despite facing legal consequences, convictions eluded him in some cases, only resulting in fines. Patia's recklessness escalated over the years. He faced charges of public nuisance, unlawful possession of suspected stolen property, and willful damage, showcasing a disregard for the law. He even breached probation orders, exhibiting a pattern of defiance. In 2012, already in a tumultuous relationship with Tara Brown, his offenses multiplied. Breaching protection orders, making threats, and causing damage, Padia displayed an alarming level of hostility. Despite short stints in prison, he seemed undeterred, facing multiple convictions and fines. Those pictures of smiles and family bliss? Turns out they hit a darker reality of abuse and control. Tara, once strong and confident, started doubting herself due to Padia's threats and manipulation. 
The couple's relationship became a turbulent cycle of breakups and reconciliations marked by police interventions and protection orders. But everything changed in 2015. During a trip to New Zealand, Tara made a courageous decision. The unraveling of Tara's life began at the departure's lounge of Auckland International Airport. She'd returned home briefly with her mother to assist in scattering her grandfather's ashes and was en route back to the Gold Coast, her residence for the past few years, when everything took a dramatic turn. Tara, her mother, and Patia were at the airport, ready to head back to Australia. Patia had come to New Zealand as well, notably opting for separate travel arrangements from Tara and her mother. While both parties were heading back to Australia on the same day, they chosen different flights and bid their farewells at the airport. They exchanged seemingly normal goodbyes at the airport. Tara began texting a friend. That's when things escalated. In a shocking twist, Padia appeared behind her out of nowhere, consumed by anger, suspecting her of unfaithfulness. A heated confrontation ensued, and Tara's attempt to escape turned into a chilling chase through the airport. Airport security guards had to intervene in order to separate the couple, However, no arrest was made. After that intense airport encounter, the situation hit a boiling point. Tara headed home, hoping for some normalcy, but things took a terrifying turn. Later that same day, Tara had returned to the home she shared with Patia to pack up her belongings. However, an enraged Patia suddenly arrived home. Patia, fueled by rage, barged into the house. The argument escalated quickly turning physical as he pushed and cornered her. The home they once shared became a battlefield. Patia shouted and urged Tara to move out, denying her access to their daughter, yet he wouldn't let her leave, cutting off her contact with the outside world. He took control, using her phone to drain her bank account and send deceitful messages to her loved ones, trying to show them what she'd done to him and how he'd been wrong. Patia was relentless hell-bent on convincing everyone of his twisted version of the truth. He was trying to get everyone that Tara knew on his side by telling them she was involved with another man. Using Tara's cell phone, Patia transferred money from her account to his, and used her Facebook account to send messages to her friends and employer, telling them what she'd done. The fact was, she'd done nothing. Days later, he heartlessly kicked Tara out, refusing to let her take their daughter, even going to the extent of leaving the child with his aunt and demanding proof that she wasn't with her own mother. Over the next few days, Tara confided in her boss at the law firm where she worked, seeking safety and was helped into a safe house. With his unwavering support, she took a crucial step towards gaining sole custody of her daughter and building a life free from her abusive partner. She stayed with a friend, hoping for a new beginning, yearning to reclaim her life establish a routine for her daughter, and finally break free from the chains of her past. Over the next few days, Tara worked with her boss on an application for sole custody for their daughter and started planning her new life. But she knew that Patia could not be trusted, so she reached out to the Gold Coast Police to get a domestic violence protection order. But they dismissed her concerns because in several cases, women made false allegations to get an upper hand in family court matters. On September 3, 2015, Tara went to the Southport Police Station. Her lawyer had called ahead to make sure she had a private room to talk to the police. She was really scared of Padia, but when they got to the police station, things didn't go as expected. The police wouldn't give them a private room. The officer at the reception didn't even want to listen to what they had to say, even though Tara had some text messages that showed Padia was threatening her. The police officer talked to the sergeant, and they both agreed that there wasn't enough proof to show that domestic violence had happened. Even though they couldn't assist Tara here, there was some good news just around the corner. Tara's fight for custody took a decisive turn on Monday, September 7, 2015, when the legal papers were delivered to Patia's lawyer. She finally had the sole custody for her three-year-old daughter. Little did anyone know this would be the trigger that pushed the 24-year-old Patia over the edge. He had been relentlessly hunting Tara, ignoring the protection order that was supposed to keep him away. The law seemed meaningless to him. On the fateful morning of Tuesday, September 8, 2015, Tara, unaware of the danger lurking, 
left her aunt's house to drop her daughter off at daycare. If only she knew that Pandia had called the daycare half an hour earlier inquiring about their daughter's schedule. Tara had just dropped off her little girl and started driving away in her Mazda, feeling a sense of relief. But in a horrifying twist, Padia, driving his menacing black SUV, appeared out of nowhere, tailing her closely. With fear gripping her, Tara frantically dialed triple zero. He's gonna stab me, she pleaded, the desperation evident. At an intersection, trapped by a red traffic light, Padia closed in, cornering her. He viciously pounded the glass, demanding she get out of the car. A flicker of hope emerged as the light changed and Tara hit the gas, escaping his clutches. However, Padia, undeterred, chased after her. Tara's pleas for help echoed through the air, the panic in her voice growing as she desperately cried out the name of her location, urging the police to come to her aid. Padia then ran his own girlfriend off the road and bashed her to death with a 7.8 kilogram metal fire hydrant cover while she lay helpless in the overturned vehicle. In haunting CCTV footage that surfaced, Padia could be seen grabbing the deadly fire hydrant cover and charging towards Tara's car. The scene was a horrifying glimpse into the unfathomable violence that followed. During these dark moments, a neighbor, Lisa Kennedy, captured the prelude to this heinous act on her own CCTV. Witnessing the unfolding tragedy, she rushed down her driveway, screaming and desperately trying to aid Tara. She recounted her frantic attempts to intervene, pleading for help and shouting at Padia. In a tragic twist of fate, other neighbors, unaware of Padia's murderous intent, rushed to the overturned car, assuming he was there to assist. They unknowingly aided him in breaking one of the car windows, unaware of the unimaginable tragedy that had just transpired. It was only upon hearing Tara's cries that they realized the horrifying truth. Padia was there to inflict harm. Padia ruthlessly fought off those who tried to stop him, leaving a community shattered and grappling with the horrifying and savage reality of domestic violence. On September 8, 2015, Liano Padia turned himself into the police about 30 minutes after killing Tara Brown. He pleaded guilty to her murder and was sentenced to 20 years in jail in 2017. Once a bandito biker, Leano Padia faced the unyielding hands of justice as he was handed a life sentence for the savage murder of Tara Brown on the Gold Coast. Dressed in a somber black suit and black tie, his wrists bound in handcuffs, Padia remained stoic as Natalie Hinton, Tara's mother, addressed the court, labeling him a monster for claiming her daughter's life. Hinton vividly painted Tara as a warm-hearted, trusting individual who cherished life from a very young age. According to Hinton, Padia habitually sought validation from Tara and used insidious domestic violence tactics like gaslighting to shatter her self-esteem. In her eyes, Tara became ensnared, living in fear under the control of this monstrous presence. Ms. Brown was the fatal victim of Padia domestic violence. She lost her life at his hands in a traumatic and evil way. She will not now have the joy of seeing her daughter grow up or fulfill the promise of the life that she'd led until she was killed by Padia. Tara's mother, Natalie Hinton, was crying quietly as she heard how Padia bashed her daughter's head and pushed away people who tried to stop him. I was oblivious to the extent of his sickening actions, she said. My whole world caved in around me as this misogynist narcissist murdered my baby girl. There were already too many indicators of his violence, but no one could identify and take serious action against him on time. Firstly, the police officers failed to take into account how serious her situation was just days before her death and couldn't save her life. Queensland Health also made some serious mistakes. Even though Tara mentioned her relationship anxiety during a prenatal appointment, no one followed up on it during later visits. Then when she was giving birth, the hospital staff heard Padia threaten to slit Tara's mother's throat because she didn't greet him. Despite knowing about the domestic violence protection order that said he shouldn't be there, they still allowed him to stay for the birth, and they didn't call the police. Finally, while delivering a life imprisonment sentence for the murder conviction, Justice Deborah Mullins expressed her wish that Padia had paid close attention to Hinton's words, which highlighted the profound effect of Tara's death, a pain beyond mere words. Padia affirmed that he pleaded guilty with the complete backing of his family, 
who motivated him to confront the consequences of his deeds.